Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Thank you for coming again. And today we are going to finish our discussion on Sikhism and talking about the core beliefs and practices. And the place where you find most of these core beliefs and practices will be in the Guru Granth Sahib, which is the scripture of the Sikhs. Uh, again, this is considered to be a guru, um, along with being the supreme spiritual authority and head of the Sikh religion. This was initially begun as the Adi Granth in 1604 by the Guru Arjan, who I talked about in our last video, and then was completed in around 1707. And that original copy does still exist. So it's kind of cool that we do have a religious book and scripture with the original copy. It's pretty impressive. Now, the book itself is divided up into 33 sections. It opens with an epic poem by Guru Nanak. And then the rest of it is actually mostly hymns. So which is really interesting is most of the Guru Granth Sahib is actually sung, which, you know, many religions have songs and hymns and stuff like that. But the fact that the scripture is a hymn is really, really, I think, impressive and, and unique. Because this was the compiled hymns of not only gurus, but also many saints, obviously this work is sacred. But not only is it sacred, it is believed that it should never be changed. So there's no changing of like a potential grammar error or to try to make something sound a little better or more modern. We don't change the words here in any shape or form. The Guru Granth Sahib is written in the Gurmurki script, which is better known as Punjabi. And in a Gurdwara, which is a, quote, Sikh temple slash church. It is often in some elevated type of throne. It is often protected by a canopy. It is always carried on the head. It is never put on the floor. Most Gurdwaras have a position called a Granthi, whose job it is to actually care for the text. And this is where we're going to find the key beliefs at. And we have to stop, start, not stop, we have to start with God. This is a monotheistic religion. All right. And it is also believed by the, the Sikhs that all people inherently do worship one divine being. Uh, that being is referred to as Wahaguru. And Wahaguru is formless and without gender. This is really, really interesting. Now, in some of the hymns and some of the sayings, people will occasionally refer to God in the masculine. I think just maybe as being kind of easy using like he or him, but the belief inherently is again, God is formless and without gender. So there's no picture of God. There's no statue of God, which I'll talk about more in a little bit anyway. And again, God is all powerful is the creator of all things. But most importantly is that this is a God of love and caring and that your goal is to, to ultimately commune with this loving God and that you love God and God loves you. And it's an interesting focus on this kind of love and kindness. Now, to go along with that, there's a lot of belief of equality because the idea is that God does indeed live within the world that God created. And as a result, God is div the divine of God, if you will, the divine is equally present in all things, which inherently means that all people are equal. So this is regardless of caste, gender, ethnicity, economic level, religious beliefs that all people are equal, in particular women. And this is really important. You know, if you go in the 1400s, 1600s, when this religion is developing and you go not only in places of northern India, but most of the world, women didn't have rights. They weren't seen as equal. And here you have a religion where there is a big focus on that equality of all people, in particular women. Because ultimately, the belief is that anyone can connect with God. Anyone can have a relationship with God. And your background, ethnicity, things like that, that does not prohibit you from having a relationship with God. And thus, we should not discriminate against people. It's really wonderful. 
probably the deepest belief to understand outside of the equality and again, the monotheism with one God is this belief in Maya. And the idea behind Maya is that the pursuit of worldly goods and attractions only gives you the illusion of satisfaction and indeed happiness. And it actually distracts you from gaining the salvation of God. And inherently what that means is that the world itself is an illusion, that it doesn't provide you really anything. And that the purpose of your life is to reconnect and ultimately join with the timeless one or God. And the way that you do that is through your own personal journey, that you as an individual have to not only follow the ideas of Sikhism, but you are the one that has to find God. And you do that through your own journey, that you use the teachings of the gurus to allow yourself to connect with God in your own search for truth. However, this takes a long time. And as a result, the Sikhs believe in a soul and the idea of samsara or reincarnation and karma, and that your soul will be reborn until you're able to gain the grace of God, which I'll talk about more in a second. And it is also believed that your soul has actually gone through countless births and deaths even before becoming human and can continue on until your ultimate goal, again, is gaining the grace of God. You're not trying to get enlightenment and the rejection of all things. Rather, it's the acceptance of all, of, of the love of God and understanding the purpose of God and truth. And when you do that, you don't necessarily die. Rather, you leave this world so that you may commune with God. And what prevents you from doing that? are these five vices, ego, anger, greed, material attachment, and lust. I think we understand all of them. The number one vice is typically seen as ego. And that if you can avoid these things and not practice these things, that you can indeed receive God's grace. So the question is, how do we avoid those five vices? Well, we have the main principles of Sikhism, and this is where the focus of your life should be. One, that you're absorbed in meditation and prayer. Uh, there's lots of prayer. There's lots of meditation that you need to work on yourself. You need to think about God's grace and love. And there's specific prayers and things like that that you should follow. That you do work, that you work hard, and that you make an honest income. That you don't deceive people or lie to people. That you work hard at the job that you have. And that based on that job, the earnings that you get, you actually share those. So the giving of money of charity, but not only money, that you also serve others. Charitable work is really, really important. And if you think about it, I talked about this already with the Golden Temple, how the focus of the Golden Temple, it's actually the largest like free kitchen in the world, right? If anybody there is hungry, you can go to the, the temple, no matter what faith you are, and you can get food. And that's really important. So you can't just like give money and then kind of forget about your community. You need to not only share your wealth with other people, but also share your time and effort. And then avoiding things like blind rituals. They, the Sikhs felt that a lot of rituals in the religions that were around them, things like Islam, Hinduism, even Buddhism and stuff like that, that had rituals that don't really allow you to get any closer to God, that you do them just to do them. So things like fasting and um, religious vegetarianism, uh, pilgrimages, superstitions, yoga, stuff like that, and in particular, the worshiping of idols, they feel that statues and artwork is in many ways sacrilegious and that people end up worshiping that material thing if you remember in the previous video, or if you haven't seen the previous video, feel free to look at the Sikhism one video. And I talk about how I had a, a single picture of the Guru Nanak, and then a, another picture that depicted all of the gurus. That, honestly, those pictures are pretty much the only ones that you'll find. They were done to just give people an idea of, you know, the gurus themselves and what they look like. And this is not something that they continue to do. And so you're not going to see statues at a Gurdwara. You're not going to see... Um, lots of artwork because you need to focus on God, not the image of what you think God or a guru could be. Now, as a result, you then need to follow four commandments. Um, number one, do not dishonor the intention by cutting any hair. So the Sikhs do not cut any body hair. Their hair grows very, very long. 
And the idea is that uncut hair is a symbol of a simple life and a denial of pride. It's also a symbol of holiness and strength and devotion to God. Women will wear their hair in elaborate braids. Men will braid their hair and then wear it under turbans. Do not harm the body with tobacco or other intoxicants. Pretty straightforward. No alcohol, drugs, things like that. Do not eat sacrificial meat. Now, I know this might sound weird, but in many religions around them, there were often sacrifices to God or gods. And in many cases, those sacrifices were fairly brutal to the animals. Uh, Sikhs do not believe in, in harming things like that. Uh, you can eat and, and whatnot, but you need to butcher animals in a very quick and humane way. And because sacrificial animals did not often were not done that way, that you can't do that. That You need to make sure if you are eating meat, that those animals were butchered quickly and humanely and do not commit adultery. And if you follow these four things, that is going to allow you to get closer to God. Now, the Sikhs are also very big about identifying who they are. The community is very tight. As I said, at one point, there is, under the Mughal Empire, there is active discrimination and oppression of them. And instead of trying to hide in the shadows, rather, they banded together. And so you typically have five items that the Sikhs will have on them at any and all times. One is a kachera which is a specialized cotton undergarment, which is a symbol of chastity and etiquette and dignity. A kanga, it's over here, which is a wooden comb, which symbolizes a neat and organized life. A kara, which is an iron or steel bracelet, which is an unbreakable attachment and commitment to God. The kesh is your uncut hair. And as you see here, men wearing that uncut hair in a turban and women wearing braids. And a kirpan, which is a small sword or dagger, which is for the defense of religious rights and the faith. There is also ritual prayer, because as I mentioned before, and I mentioned in the last video, many of the beliefs here you can see kind of stem from a combination of aspects of both Hinduism and Islam. And one of the things that comes from Islam is a ritual prayer five times a day. And this is in a in addition to deep meditation. And you can pray at home, but another great place to do some of these rituals and prayer is a Gurdwara. The Gurdwara is the center and very important building of the community. This is where many services are held and celebrations and rituals of a Sikh community. Well, this will definitely be like the main physical part there are some rules and regulations uh, that if you go into a Gurdwara, there are to be no shoes. You need to cover your head. In some places, they make you wash your hands and feet because cleanliness is very important. However, what's really cool about the Gurdwara is that they are open. They are open to people of all faiths at any and all time. You can go and see some Sikh rituals and prayers being done because it is a very open religion. They welcome anyone in. Ultimately, they would like people to follow the ideas of Sikhism, but they do not look to discriminate if you are not Sikh, but they want to share their beliefs with people. And that's why these are open. And again, most of these Gurdwaras also double as the equivalent of a soup kitchen and people who are hungry, no matter what faith you are, if you need food, they're going to help you out. And then we have a few rituals and celebrations. So the first one is Nam Karam. This is really interesting. This is... Um, the bringing of a, of a new child into the faith. This is a naming ceremony in which the child is brought into uh, their Gurdwara and the family will randomly open the Guru Granth Sahib and find the first hymn on the page that they open it to. And then the first letter of the first word of the hymn becomes the first letter of the child's name, which is then announced to the congregation. So it's a really wonderful ceremony of welcoming new children into the faith. One of the big ones is Amrit Sanskar, which is a ritual baptism. And this was started by the Guru Gobind Singh in trying to kind of reaffirm the faith and what it means to be a Sikh. And this is something that you don't do as a child. You do it when you feel that you have reached a spiritual evolution, that you are prepared to truly follow all of the commandments, if you will, in Sikhism. 
And so the first thing that you do is you are baptized with water and then you drink Amrit, which is a, a sugar water, which is stirred with a dagger. After you are baptized and you drink the water, you are instructed to uphold the four commandments as well as uh, other ideas of the Sikhs. In order to be baptized properly, you must be attended by five other fully baptized members of the Sikh community. You can see the one there, there in the orange, and trust me, there's a fifth one there, just therefore in the picture. And at that point, you're joined what is known as the Khalsa, in the fully baptized member of the community. And now it is your job to uphold these beliefs. And so really, really interesting. I think it's really interesting because you, you do it when you're, you know, when you're ready. And finally, we have a few others. Uh, there are very elaborate funeral ceremonies. Um, most of them result in cremation, which is very, very important. One of the other big ones is Akhand, the Akhand path, which is the reading of the Guru Granth Sahib from beginning to end. This is often done to celebrate um, joyous occasions or to be used in times of hardship to support. And then finally, we have a series of um, Gurpurbs, which are general celebrations of the anniversaries associated with the lives of the Gurus. So hopefully this video gave you just a general introduction into the beliefs and practices of Sikhs. And in general, I hope you learned something new here. I really appreciate everybody stopping by and I'll see you soon. Take care, everybody.